this is the is module five how to perform a crash evaluation and, and really it's it's more of the the crash data focus part of it right because we've been talking the last few times um <clears throat> about the, like like how to think through it what types of evaluations we do this is getting the data to actually put in towards it um just our our daily reminder of why we're doing it right so we've got 27 28 people in this uh training right now um so once again every day this many people so basically this session and next session um would be included in the statistic focus on zero and just a reminder as we go through the whole goal of this is to to go through the skills necessary to get to the point where we are um, proficiently solving problems on our own projects if we look at a roadmap we've been through the introduction We've talked about spot treatments, uh, systemic analysis, best practices, standards, root cause analysis, hotspots, um, just the, the general ideas of how, you know, how we're looking at crash data and solving it. We've talked about the safe system approach. Uh, yesterday or two days ago, we talked about the termination of countermeasures, how to think through it, look at the CMF clearinghouse. And today with the crash uh, um, with the how to perform a crash evaluation, we're going to understand the crash data that's available where and how to get that crash data. Um, a, very, a little bit about the difference between data and analysis um, and understanding uh, some crash numbers and crash rates. We're gonna break this down. Um, there's some crash data guidance the states put together. We're gonna break this down to kind of cover that. Uh, so we have downloading the data, uh, cleaning up the data, summarizing it, and then finally doing the safety analysis just to kind of logically break the steps up into the different skill sets that we're going to need to address. So where do we find it? Um, I hope by now you know, we are familiar with the safety data integration space. If we're not, uh, safety data integration space is something central office has worked on. Um, it's a, a repository of all the necessary crash and, uh, crash and safety information and dashboards that you're going to need. <clears throat> so the safety crash data guidance is a PDF that walks you through the crash data process. Um, it's an excellent document that's been put together, uh, covering most of the information that we're going to have in this presentation. Signal four is our go to for crash data. And you've got SSO GIS, FARS, there's a few others. Um, and if you like, if you like the, the trends analysis, we've got a number of dashboards. I'm pointing out the HSIP before and after. That's where we found the, uh, I showed the information in the introduction showing how effective we've been with. Um, safety projects and the transportation safety view which lets you sort by county district mpo um crash emphasis area just different things to kind of kind of look at what the safety trends are in, in different areas so what is the crash data process right so downloading data um getting the being able to obtain the access to crash data and crash data reports um <clears throat> so with signal four everyone starts off with a basic level Everyone with FDOT account starts off with a, a basic account, right? Um, there's a request later to get to more information. And then with consultants, the FDOT project manager has to request the new user access. SSO GIS is publicly available. SSO GIS is informed from the other crash data systems. It's kind of downstream. So really, once you have your, your signal for information, SSO GIS is just becomes it's it's not as needed. Um, when you're downloading crash data, you start to think about you know, what years do I do I need? Um, am I looking screening specifically for certain injuries? Do I want to see all injuries? Do I want to see certain crash types? Um, what users are involved? You know, are you are you looking at the vulnerable user population? Uh, things like that. You're going to get into cleaning your data. Um, some of the data that's involved that you, when you do your pool um may need some modification you know at the at the very minimum um the the data set that comes in uh there's certain there's certain data sets that um or cer certain data fields that to get to that normal like you know severe injury injury no injury pdo only the, there does have to be a little bit of a, a recode into, into it um, and then, of course, when you're in, even though we do a great job of, of reading through and getting location data, sometimes when you get into the narrative, you can find differences. So just making sure that you make the corrections when it's needed. Summarizing the data. Um, data doesn't really help us unless we can actually do something with it. So being able to put it into a format that's easy to understand, easy to read, 
um, and being able to see those trends and get some good information out of it. And then finally, the analysis. Right, so being able to take that data, we have the summarized version and then finally start drawing conclusions. So what is actually going on with this? Um, and how do we apply those skills that we've learned in the other modules uh, to actually solve that? So getting into downloading the data, right? So who's responsible for the different databases? Um, so tech, the technical responsibility, we're looking at Signal 4's, um, the Geoplan Center, University of Florida. Um, SSO GIS is the State Safety Office, and then crash reports are FLHSMD. So <clears throat> what's interesting about Signal 4, though, is even though it's maintained by the university, um, uh, SSO is responsible for the crash data in Signal 4, and that data is replicated from Signal 4 into the older car system and from there into the SSO GIS environment. Um, for crash reports, though, even though they're represented and they can be downloaded from Signal 4, only FLH SMP is responsible for those. The Signal 4 function lets us look them up using a web service provided by the FLH SMP that looks directly at the Highway Safety and Motor Vehicle database. So that's some, some important there, especially as we start talking about some legal issues down the road. So what's the, the differences, right? Um, Signal 4 it receives crash data records from FLHSMV. Ports are maintained, managed and maintained only by them, like we said earlier. You have access to view it view via the web service. Um, the database is a little bit different on timelines, how they geolocate, and some of the other data features. The, the requires access to be granted. Like I said, it, with a DOT account, you have a basic user access to get further into it and more um, access to the actual crash reports. Requires additional approval. Um, it has long form and short form crashes. We'll discuss that and define that later. Just know that both crash um, form types are in there. SSOGIS is long form only and it's public access, as we said earlier. So the crash processing timeline. <clears throat> So what happens between a crash actually happening and a database crash record? And this is one of the important things, right? Because we want to make sure that we're getting good, accurate information. So if, when we go off of the um, the crash data guidance, we're looking at um, you know 100 days crash occurrence. Initial reporting is within 10 days. Looking at privacy regulations expiring and expiring, it's more of a change. Um, but 60 days after the initial report and looking to try to get final reporting within 90 days. So with that that 60 day expiration, it's it's not a full expiration. They're they're a bit modified. Um, essentially, before 60 days, only certain parties are eligible to um, are able to access the crash reports and data. After 60 days, the redacted um, crash reports and data may be available to anyone. Uh, but the unredacted is still restricted. And then after 60 days, in addition to the eligible parties, crash data and reports can be obtained for certain uses defined by statute. And I know, like I said, this is, this is going to be a little bit dry, uh, but we do have to get through some of these legal issues. Um, it's been a big deal recently. Uh, so <clears throat> FLHSMV processing is 13 months. Um, Annual crash data window up to 100 days after December 31st, and the annual cleaning crash data is seven to 10 months. Uh, to get to actual FDOT, you're looking at um, you know 10 months. Location that's when the the location verification is completed. Um, the reason why it's important to know is what we're seeing is it's that lag. There's there's a, a realistic lag in reporting, right? Um, making sure that we understand that what we're looking at with crash data, it it there may be stuff missing, it may be partial information when you're getting to a certain deal that you can um, only really count on the full data set being there after a certain amount of time. Doesn't mean you won't find something or it won't be there. It's just the the data sets start to change, and a lot of times you'll see that when you're looking at um, trend reports and stuff like that, where the um, you'll see different crash numbers sometimes for the same reports being pulled, and it's really hard to dial down to the exact same number sometimes. And it's not that the crash that, that everything's wrong. It's just the fact that um, there there sometimes gets to be differences in how the what crash reports are in there and sometimes how the query is done a little bit. 
So just taking what we said um, and putting it into a timeline. Um, so if you have, you know, beginning, beginning of the calendar year for crash recruiters, you say January 1st, um, by December 31st of that year is the end of the calendar year for all the crash records. Um, on April 10th, it allows 100 days to receive the crash data from law enforcement. By October 29th, um, it's, it's finished, it's finalized for all crash severities. And then the location is verified within 10 months for all crash severities um, with FDOT. There's a difference, though, between the all crash severities and fatal and serious injuries. Um, with fatal and serious injuries, especially since we're trying to, to make that focus, and, the, and there's fewer than all crashes, right? Um, you're looking at trying to get those that crash data into F, the FDOT databases within 110 days. Um, so once we receive, to, to get from um, the crash to the finalized crash record from F, FLHSMV is 100 days, and then um, SSL, SSO, the State Safety Office Location and Severity Verification happens within 10 days and gets updated. Uh, so they've made a lot of progress um, in the past few years of making sure that that information is up to date and as usable as possible for our project managers and the people that are doing the safety analyses. <clears throat> and once again, um, throwing it in a calendar, just making sure that um, it's kind of visual because, like I said, some of the stuff gets dry, it becomes a text wall, uh, just making sure that we can kind of put it in perspective of what we're looking at in terms of of how it happens, right? Fatal crash, you get the crash report. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, with fatal crashes is that a fatal crash is defined as the the individual dying after 30 days after the crash or up to 30 days. So it could, even though it's a 10 day processing, um it could take a bit longer and if there's i don't know you just call it traffic homicide sometimes with investigations it could take a little bit more um but that initial crash report if let's say it's a severe injury and they go to the hospital um it you, it may be you know 40 days after the crash actually happened because the fatality hasn't occurred until 30 days after the crash happened on reports out um, and then you can see the FDOT processing happens very, very quickly of making sure uh, once it's received, they um, Ben Jacobs and his folks get on it very quickly and get it updated into our databases. So before we get into the legal discussion, which um, which we're just going to buckle up for, I think. Um, <laughs> any questions so far on that data and the crash processing timelines? All right, so the legal discussion, um, this has changed a little bit recently. Uh, so who can get access to crash data and when? Um, so the unredacted crash data, uh, no one can get immediate access to a period. Um, unredacted crash data more than 60 days after the initial report is submitted, um, there is there's is a, a set of qualifying criteria that you can kind of get into that and then redacted crash data and getting that immediately. Um, it takes a memorandum of understanding with um, FLHSMV and only for the purpose of identifying vehicles and then redacted crash data is more than 60, 60 days after the initial report is submitted. Um, basically redacted crash data, it's, it's, it's trying to protect people's identities of who's being involved in the crash and making sure that identifying information is, is removed. Um, stopping the, the information in here, crash data is less than 60 days old or confidential and exempt from, uh, review and public records request. The, the access to this data is limited to FDOT accounts. The data cannot be shared with anyone outside of FDOT until 60 days after the data of the crash report is filed. Um, so at the direction of so the FDOT, the Office of General Counsel, the, their direction right now is that sharing redacted data after 60 days is business as usual. Um, all the data reports and standard extracts from CAR and Signal 4 are automatically redacted and they don't expose the personal the identifying information. So if you're doing a crash pools, um, that information is out there. Uh, if it's 60 days after it occurred, you're good to go. And, you know, it, it, there may be some value when you're, we'll talk about like pulling crash dates and the dates that we use are just to get the sheer most amount of information possible. 
um, there may be some value in restricting to, you know, something instead of going up to today's date when you're pooling it, maybe looking 60 days prior to that date so that you don't you're not getting um, running afoul of the new requirements. FDOT has signed a memorandum of understanding granting us access within the initial 60 day window. Um, you know, there there are some data needs of that uh, and, it, and it's a judgment of the person pulling crashes whether you want to try to get into that 60 day window or not and whether it's it is needed um i will say being um you know in formally in traffic ops and the safety group there are there are needs for that especially with some of the high profile crashes being able to get in there and start and start looking for solutions and addressing some of those issues uh, but it may not be needed in necessarily say a pdme project a design project you may be able to um, to look at the older data window and not have to worry about this. <clears throat> when the redacted data becomes available in Signal 4, FDOT um, and the consultants working for us just need to be aware we can't share the data outside until after the six days have passed. And the FDOT public portal and data sets, so SSO GIS, um, have been updated not to include any crashes less than 60 days old. <laughs> Just reiterating that 60 day is key. Um, we can't share them with anyone who is not eligible to receive them if it's um, with some of those some of those documents, right? Uh, being able to use the documents for FTOT purposes, but we we have to be careful with it, with downloading them and making sure that we are not accidentally giving um, with crash access, right? Uh, so any sharing of unredacted documents with someone outside of FDOT. Uh, who is eligible to receive them re requires the person receiving the documents submit a sworn statement that establishes their identity, their ability to eligibility to receive the documents and their agreements only to use them as permitted under Florida statute. I am not an expert in this, so this is something where for me, um, I'm, I think personally I'm going to practice more of the avoidance part of the statute where I'm just going to be careful that I don't put myself in that situation um, to where I've got to be able to, I have to navigate that right so being careful very very careful for getting within that 60 day window hey Nathan um, yes Ben Jacobs provided a little bit additional con uh, context in the in the meeting chat just saying that if you work for FDOT and are asked or required to provide the crash reports uh, in response to a request you know, you as the FDOT employee must redact those documents and make sure you're blacking out any any potentially personal identifying information. So um, it, viewing the documents from the source does not constitute having a copy downloading them does. Um, if we create copies of those documents. Uh, so like if you're saving them down like uh, when you get into signal four it gives you an option to download crash reports if you did that you've got them in a zip file you've now created a copy on your computer um they'll become documents held by fdot and are subject to public records requests and subject to confidentiality requirements so at that point if you have them if you start sending them through email someone asks then you're going to have to go through and start redacting that information um and then let's see and uh, so Trong, we have I think we have a couple yes. of questions. Nathan, if now's a good time to pause. I know Trong, you have your hand raised. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I have been using, if not like daily basic, the signal for crash re, uh, data report uh, for a while. I did not know about this one. <laughs> so I, I'm wondering, you know, like, um, if, if, if there's, and I don't know how many people out there didn't know about the 60 day uh, time frame like this. And um, I, I don't know if, if the Signal 4 even had the, the function for us to, you know, filter out. My point is, you know, when it's up to the user to, because every single time, and my point is, if, if the Signal 4 had the function for us to choose whether or not we want to accept the last 60 day uh, crash data. And when we click on that, they kind of like pop up the window, let us know, hey, this one is the, the crash data that, um, you know, you maybe be careful when we want to share the information outside, something like that. So um, just, just wonder if, if that function is even there in the Signal 4 uh, database. So the, the easy way, and um, Ben, feel free to chime in, but um, 
the easy way is the initial account, I, I believe, restricts you from getting access to it. I think you got to get the, I'll call it an upgraded account, but the additional access. Um, honestly, the easy way is when you're doing your, your crash data query, uh, you select the date range, right? So the easy way to avoid it is just saying, hey, like if, you, if you're going to pull crashes today on a project, um, it, just making sure that, you know, you don't pull April's crashes and March's crashes, like you would go to the end of February and that puts you outside that 60 days. So anything that you download, it, does, it you're not going to have at least within the 60 day window. Yeah, I can say on that, um, Signal 4 does, for people who have access to data less than 60 days old through Signal 4, the Signal 4 window has a message that is meant to remind you that you, you have access to restricted data. Um, for those who don't have access, the message isn't there, but again, it's not an issue because you can't see the data that are less than 60 days old. Um, and all the data that you get, data as distinct from reports, right? Data, 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 not documents. The data you get through Signal 4 is, like Nathan said, autom already uh, redacted. So it's, um, it's, uh, it should be uh, non-confidential at that point after 60 days. Lori? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, would it make sense or not make sense if you pulled data and then waited 60 days? Because 60 days later, it might have changed or there might have been updates to it. So, mm -hmm. or would it be the same? There could very well be updates within the 60 days um, and after. Uh, so, I, Brenda, Brenda's a little, Brenda Young is, you know, um, the, safety engineering supervisor in central office and she's of the opinion that you should get the most recent data that you can whenever you run the study but because of the amount of additions and changes especially in the first 60 days i don't think it hurts to wait and then in any case if you pull data and you have even aggregated numbers um, you can't share that those numbers outside of dot until the 60 days have elapsed. So it, yeah, it's it, it's 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 not bad to um just to, to wait the 60 days if, if you can. And, and I think I think it depends on like, if you think about how to put this. So any decision that you make, you ne you never make a decision with every bit of information, right? And that's part of like um if you talk to any like management and FDOT, it's the idea, it's the skill of figuring out how much information to make a good decision because um, it's never going to be perfect. So it's kind of the same a little bit with crash data, right? Um, what's the purpose of your analysis? If you're doing a 3R project and you're looking for uh, crashes to see what kind of safety feature needs to be put into that 3R project, um, there's less of a need. It's not more data. The additional data is always good, but the chance that something within that 60 days is going to drastically change that type of an analysis, it, there, there's a much lower chance that something like that's going to happen, right? Um, whereas, or if you're doing like a network analysis, like that 60 days is not as critical. Um, where it's very critical is, um, so I don't know if they, then do you know if it, it I'm not a part of the mailing list anymore. Does FHP still send the notices out? I, I don't think I ever was part of the mailing list. Um, I, I'm i not sure they still do. So um, when I was safety engineer, FHP sent out notifications of fatal crash reports. Um, and it was one of those like you would you'd you'd get in the office in the morning um, and you'd have like two or three emails from FHP where there's been different fatal crashes that night. Um, and it was something where when it comes to fatalities, especially, uh, because it's such a significant event in people's lives, those are the ones that tend to get politically hot quickly. Um, and it's ones where understanding what's going on and whether a change needs to be made, like we need to have a plan to address it today. Uh, that's where it starts to become very, very critical. Um, it, 
I don't know that if you are on like a longer term work program style project and it's not something that your job requires you to address now. I don't know that the 60 days is getting that additional 60 days is worth the hassle. Um, I think you'd probably be well served by just making sure you have really good data analysis and really good data pools with older than 60 days. Um, any other questions on this? And by the way, hey, Mason. Ben, ben is here. So if you have any in-depth questions, we have the expert. Yes, Tracy. Okay, so, so Nathan, you just mentioned like FHP sent you email mm -hmm. for like what just happened like yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. How to get that access? We, we kind of have that situation. Well, we totally understood, you know, it takes like 60 days, get the final report. It would be ideal condition for us to react to anything like when we have a final report, because that's all the kind of official information. And then we, we don't really want to make any decision without um, official or full information. And however, there's a situation like high profile thing happened, like a runway driving, you know, fatal yesterday. Well, I just make that like we will immediately get an email from leadership, say, well, what happened? Can you do analysis? Uh, I hate to say that. See, well, we have to wait for 60 days. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I, I, I hope we can get that access, especially, you know, for safety office, get that kind of access. We can at least know the initial information first, and we can start to do the analysis and um, maybe get uh, maybe updated after 60 days to see if anything changed. So that will be good to have. So I'm uh, just curious, like, if you just happen to know, like, you know, if we can get that yes. direct access. So I I don't, Ben, sorry, did you have an answer? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you, you can have access to data less than 60 days old now. Well, I think she's talking about the stuff from the notices from FHP, though. Oh, um, the, you mean the, the their, like their daily update? Yes. Right. So, so I, yeah. I'm not. That's why I was asking Ben if it's still available. I don't have access to it right now. Um, I did. So I've been gone three years now. Um, I did until the day I left. It was you. I had to contact the leader of the troop. So I think uh, D1 is Troop F and Troop C. Um, I think F is I4 corridor and C was the I-75 corridor. I'm not sure who is in your area. So whoever your troop leader is, um, you would get on their mailing list because they've got a number of folks they send it out. Um, I will say we used it in the D1 culture change. Um, it's depressing. It's because when you're pulling crash data, you're seeing snapshots and it's it's still numbers. Um, it is seeing the daily emails is probably the, the single the single thing that will um, cre create a group of people that are very concerned about safety or just want to shut it out. Um, when we did some of our meetings, we had a few cost center engineers or, or cost center um, managers, like the design, design, um, ISD, stuff like that, that wanted to be added to it because like, oh yeah, we're passionate about safety. And it took about two months before they started asking me taken off of it. Um, because you're looking and you're seeing the snapshots when you're doing normal safety analysis. But this is literally like you come in on a Monday and there's there's, you know, that one of them that stuck with me was um, there was a blind curve that uh, I think we talked about with optical speed bars um, in one of the other ones. If not, it's we can talk about it. And it was um, a, 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 a woman with uh, young kids, two young kids um, passed on a blind curve and hit a guy with one young kid and that just described what happened. And it's it's ones where you start getting a little more radicalized for safety uh, because it, you are seeing it every single morning that you come in, the people that have died in your area and how they died. Katie, so I Nathan, was, was that the email that like they send to the media? Like, hey, this happened. Is it kind of like a media release ones? Because we were it, getting those in District 4 and then we stopped. So I actually emailed Lieutenant Miranda, which is with our troop, back in April. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to follow up with her again. 
I don't remember if it was a media release or not. I, I okay. seem to remember it being more rash reporty, if that makes okay. if that's a good yeah, yeah, yeah. A good advocate. Okay. But um no. but I think it would be very similar. I mean, understanding that yeah. that happened and what was going on. Um and, and mm -hmm. like to Tracy to Tracy's point, you know, those are the ones that you don't have all the information, but it gives you enough that you can start looking into it and you have an answer for someone if the secretary calls. All right. Any uh any questions on that? Okay. So getting access to the signal four, right? Uh Nathan, um, you do have one more question. Okay. Julia. It's more of a comment. I just wanted to say um Going back to the Dutch training that I did last week, the big push in the 70s in the Netherlands for better cycling infrastructure, um, the entire political movement, the slogan was basically stop murdering our children, um, which is like very harsh. But um, anyway, just something to chew on. I thought that was really intense and interesting. It is. And what's interesting too is, um some of the other countries do not pull punches when it comes to their their safety ads. Um, yeah, you know, we saw the uh, the aggressive driving ad that we had kind of a lo-fi mix. Um, there's one, in, uh, I want to say it's from Australia, that it was pretty poignant because it was, um, it, it's a guy, he's got a kid in the backseat and he's pulling out from a side street. Um, and there's another, another uh, vehicle coming down as a T intersection and time stops. They just freezes right and but both the guy the, the two drivers are not frozen they get out and they start talking and um the the driver that pulled out with this kid he's like hey man like can you just like not hit me and he's like I, dude I'm, I'm going too fast i can't i can't stop you pulled out and they start having this conversation and um you see the realization that the crash is inevitable and it's going to happen and there's no way that they can prevent it um so the guy that is driving on the main line starts to get like this really awful look on his face like hey i'm walking away i can't help you um and then the uh the guy that pulled out starts to realize like hey i'm i'm, I'm about to die and uh, they get into their cars um and the guy in the side street kind of like looks back at his kid and then you see the time start and, he, and it just like uh it goes staticky right um, so you start getting some really, really brutal messages, but in, in reality, it, it is kind of, like I said, that, that was one of the things being able to see, having to read the crash reports as they happen, that starts kind of radicalizing for safety, understanding that, um, like we see all the data, but it's not in your day to day. And you start looking at EPS scores, you start looking at what the process and the procedure is, but when you start, it, it's in your face and it becomes humanized, you start realizing that it really is a big issue, um, and start focusing on it a lot more. So getting access. Um, so the FDOT agency default um, account settings are are such that a basic account is automatically created in Signal 4 when a user with a valid FDOT um, logs in for the first time. Uh, they won't have access to the crash report documents, um, won't allow the user to search and review any crash data for records that were submitted to FLHSMV less than 60 days from the date that they run the query. Um, so you can log into Signal 4, use the query tools, the network analysis that's available within it. Um, but it's it, you're not going to get access to anything, any of the confidential stuff. It, you have to request the additional access to start getting into some of the sensitive information and more up to date information. Um, contracted employees who are not working as staff augmentation can be granted access. The project manager or supervisor will need to do that through the account request page. Um, and you can see kind of the banner ahead on, on top of Signal 4 saying, uh, like Ben said earlier, just saying, you know, your, the use of data and response is restricted. Um, here's here's the date ranges that you can actually get the information um, and the, there's the warning that kind of pops up. So once again, this is 
I'm putting it in here because it's going to be posted later. Um, we're not going to read through the whole all of it right now, but I want to make sure that that information is there uh, so that as we refer back to it, making um, we can understand what is allowed and what's what's going to be provided in different accounts. Um, so the default for project consultants is after 70 days, um, but won't automatically include access to the restricted data. Uh, you do have to make a justification and a good business case for why. So to be able to do that, um, clicking on the little icon in the top right, um, going down to request an account. So the request for account for victim data, you can look at public agency employees and the agency employees once again requesting an account for your consultants. Um, the request form is there. Uh, it's reviewed by FDOT staff, typically approved for within two working days. Um, once again, uh, shout out to the, everyone that's working on the crash data, the crash data databases. Um, they are phenomenal in what they do and being able to make sure the data gets there. It's it's been uh, the improvements that have been made over the years have have been amazing and being able to get this access and be able to get the the accuracy um, and thoroughness of the data. So if you're trying to give access to um, consultants, um, you're going to click that you're a public agency manager requesting the account. You're going to select your agency. You have to set it up for them. Um, consultant vendors, so you have to have a contract with the Florida government agency, which is FDOT, county city government, MPO, uh, TPO, et cetera. The request should come from the government agency, from the project manager, or someone who's managing a contract in that side. Uh, so going through this process, filling it out for them, when they're when um, the request is received, they'll be run um, for approval by the FLHSMP and provide access. It's still within a day or two. Uh, universities can have access if they're working on a funded research project for a Florida public agency. Once again, the requests, though, are coming from the government agency. Uh, it's just making sure that the person that we, we want access to be there, that we want people making good crash data decisions, um, but just making sure there's a, kind of a system of checks and balances, making sure that the right people have it and they're using it for the right reasons. And then once it's done, it's just logging in with the credentials. Um, it's very easy to set up, especially if your browser remembers your password. Um, it's very easy to get in. The um, especially, and, and I want to do a shout out to, uh, especially to Ben and his team doing the CAR to Signal Four merger. Um, for those of you that have not used the CAR database, it was an entirely different skill set and um, learning learning to get through CAR. Now that everything's in Signal Four, Signal Four is very easy to use. Um, it's very user friendly. Uh, honestly, even though there's training. Uh, most of it's pretty self-explanatory. Most of you probably be able to go in from day one and be able to pull a good crash report. Um, so thank you, Ben. <laughs> Any questions so far on that? OK, so what data do we need? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to go over this. We are I'm going to provide links to some video tutorials. Um, as I was telling Katie earlier, uh, the what we're trying to get through here is the broad understanding and the broad knowledge. Um, it, we there will be there are some video tutorials already that we're going to link to, and there's going to be more produced that are going to be very specific on uh, like here's an intersection. Here's exactly like this is how you drill down and do that as well. So right in here, I want to I want to make sure we're communicating the big ideas. Uh, so minimum of 0.1 miles centers centered on the intersection. Really, what you're looking to do is make sure you're including the emphasis areas. So there's a bit of a judgment call. Um, these are guidelines. So looking at, say, the end of the turn lanes, or if you have very short turn lanes and the queuing backs up, what's what's the end of the queue look like? You know, at, at the, the cusp of that um, emphasis area of the intersection, is there a major driveway that you want to make sure that you are encompassing crash data as well? I think the point here is that you don't, need to include the entire corridor, but we want to make sure that we're getting more than just the immediate, you know, just past the crosswalks part of the intersection. We want to make sure that 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 we're, we're getting the entire emphasis area. Um, and then just the way things are geolocated, even when the locations are verified, we want to make sure that we're getting a little bit up side streets a little bit uh, as well, um, because you don't know if there's say a turning movement conflict that you see something there. Um, I did a crash analysis recently and there is a gentleman hit in a wheelchair that was crossing and we you, I've heard the argument about you know it, whether it's attributed to the intersection or not my opinion stuff like that it still is because that person is crossing 
inside the influence area, but not at the crosswalk. So there's a reason. Um, so just making sure that we were getting enough information. Um, every location, every situation is a little different. Just make sure we're getting enough to do an efficient and effective crash evaluation. Nathan, Segment before eight. you jump off that intersection slide, Ben just put in the chat where you had emphasis area. I think I heard you say influence area. So just to clarify, yeah, sorry. same terminology influence. or we should say influence. Yes, that is a typo. Okay. I need to fix that. It, it should be okay. the influence area of the intersection. All right, thank you. All right, so segments minimum length of 0.2 miles adapt to the study area. I look for logical termini. Uh, so logical termini is where it makes sense to end the project. Uh, I'll give an example of, say, median projects, right? Um, we talked about that in previous training. You don't want to look at only that location. You want to make sure you're looking at where people are going. Um, I mean, granted, there are some like project limits could be a logical termini because you know once you get to the project limits, you can't go past that without a lot of work to change it. Uh, but if if you're doing it and you're trying to find it um, using access management, for for instance. Um, you're in the project identification part of the process, you know, maybe going to signalize intersection to signalize intersection or the previous median section to something else. But but making sure that it, the, the logical term and I just means that making sure it makes sense where you're ending the project. You're not just ending it there just for re, uh, there's a good reason why you're ending it. Um, you know, if the end of your limits reach that intersection, just just go to the full intersection. Make sure you're including the turn lanes for the extents of the approaches. Um, make it make sense. When you start getting below 0.2 miles, you're not really in a segment anymore. You're at an intersection. Uh, so it's it's more of a it's a common sense thing and a judgment, right? Make sure you're using good judgment, good common sense to make sure we're incorporating everything that we need to. The flip side of this is that if you are, you know, doing an analysis in Fort Lauderdale, you don't necessarily need to bring Miami into the to the equation, right? Like we don't have to go that far to make sure. Just make it make sense. And then what period should we request? And this gets back into that legal conversation. So if we if we take the legal conversation out of it for a moment, um, you're looking at a minimum of five full calendar years and additionally up to the day of your data pool. Now, and what that would look like is if you're pooling data on 516, um, five years of data would be January 1st, 2019 to December 31st of 2023. And then from January 1st of this year, all the way up to 515, right? Um, but we're going to caveat that, right, with that 60 year day. So understand what you're trying to do and whether you that 60 days is worth the hassle of what you're doing. Otherwise, I'd back it back down to the end of February. Um, something I want to talk about with the crash data as well is just because the data exists doesn't mean it's useful. Um, the roadway changes over time and making sure that and, and that's where what's what's awesome about google earth because you know those of us that haven't been at the at the department for you know 15 plus years that knows you know you, you know that person in the department and your in your department that that has like a 30 year history of the department they remember every project back um in their time if you're not quite there yet uh Google Earth and, the, and going back in the timeline helps out tremendously of understanding if something changed. Um, even because what what, it, what amounts to, let's say you're doing a widening project, right? The it's good to know what the crash data is for that say a two lane road going to a four lane, but at the same time a four lane road may not have the same issue that two lane road did, or may have different issues and more issues because you're changing the character of the roadway. Um, I think back to an intersection project we, were, we worked on where when we pulled full five years of crash data there, it didn't rank anywhere. There, there was no issue with that intersection compared to any other intersection um, or it wasn't significantly more. So it wasn't a priority for us. Uh, but if we pull two years of data, all of a sudden it's priority shot up to one of our top intersections. And what ended up happening is we found out was that a turn, a right turn lane was added to an unsignalized intersection. And the way that that intersection was working, um, people pulling out onto the main line on US 301, um, that right turn lane, vehicles in the right turn lane were sh um, shadowing cars that were in the through lane. So people would see someone in the right turn lane turning and like, oh, they're going slow, I can pull out. 
and not see the car that's in the main line that was going to strike them. So, so just understanding too, like what's going on. It, crash data is always kind of like it depends. Um, we want that five years to get good trend data, but it also depends on what the roadway looks like. Is has something significantly changed? And you you may start to see that. And the way we deter- figured that out was um, when we started looking at the trend data you know, crashes by year, stuff like that, we started seeing trends that didn't make sense. And it gave us that clue to get in there and investigate further. So it, look for five years and then add to, to you know, let's say 60 days to today's date. Uh, but understand that when you start reviewing it, that you mean to go back and change it and modify it of what's actually useful. In that intersection example, the time before the right turn lane, it, it wasn't that it wasn't useful, but it's not as useful as it could be because the situation had changed enough. We need to start paying more attention to the data that was happening in the last two years. <clears throat> so that was the first section, right? Like getting the data. Any questions on getting the data? And this, this is a big one, right? Like th- th- this is uh, because even though we have all those those other data analyses, like the systemic analysis, whatever, all of it aside from risk factors where someone has, has you, someone before you has used the data to find it. Everything you're going to be doing is being used, is, is going to be crash data. So let's make sure we get this one, right? Lori, question. Hopefully this is <clears throat> applicable to this Q&A section. Um, so what if, what if, is crash data reported on like the closest intersection by law enforcement? What if there's areas that look like there haven't been been crashes and it seem it may is it fishy or is that accurate or could it be like you know they were reported at a different location because maybe it's I, I hate to say it but if if you're on a state road especially in an urban area and you don't see crashes there's probably something fishy going on yeah um along those lines I can say when they first switched to electronic reporting, there was a town somewhere along A1A. Their, the software they were using was had an error and none of their crashes were being submitted, but they didn't realize it. So FLHSMV finally tracked them down because they weren't reporting any crashes and they had you know hundreds of crashes from two or three years that just had never had been submitted, but never gone into the database. So things like that happen. Um, yeah. And I would add in Palm Beach County, asset maintenance knew of an area of guardrail that they continued to fix. But every time they went into Signal 4, there was no crashes in that area. And um, so they had to get with Signal 4 staff to figure out. And that road was just not identified in the system for some reason. So even though law enforcement loaded the crashes, the road wasn't set up as like a road. So, yeah, there's definitely glitches sometimes, right? And we'll talk about some of that as well. I mean, some of the older crashes too, if you're like, once you start getting way far back, you know, I, I, some of them are GPS tagged. So we started having issues in the databases where there's a lot in parking lots that shouldn't have been in parking lots. Um, a lot of that's been fixed, but there's there still are some issues, especially if you're not familiar with the area, um, but it's been significantly reduced. Um, one thing I will say, and we'll get into this a little bit as well, it's getting a little bit ahead, but um, not there's still agencies that use paper reports um and they're supposed to upload them but supposed to and do or sometimes two different things uh we had us uh on us 27 um there's a town called lake hamilton and we us 27 and crump road was the signal um and we start we kept getting uh, the police chief kept telling us that there it was it was horribly unsafe and there is an unfortunate byproduct of our industry is that sometimes you get jaded to people saying something's unsafe um, because they everyone does when they're trying to get something. Um, so we kept looking at crash today. We weren't finding anything. He kept coming to CTST meetings. Uh, we weren't seeing anything. And um, it, we started digging into it. And finally, it came up that he was doing paper reports for all the crashes. And he wasn't submitting them. He just had this folder full of paper crash reports that he had, had that he pulled out of a police cruiser somewhere. Um, and so we were finally able to rectify that. But it's one of those where if it looks suspicious, follow the thread. 
Um, you know, District Four has, you know, Ben Ben's team has always been is incredibly responsive. Like he, you can always ask him for for what's going on, or get with Tracy. Uh, the CTSTs are a good resource. Um, you know, that's one of the good things. Like what makes CTSTs useful is when law enforcement and the people participating knowing that what they're saying is making a difference. Um, Cause you think like, if you keep talking about something, nothing happens. So, you know, if you're a, a DPM or you're in planning and you're coming out and you're bringing you know, questions to them, they provide recommendations and you implement the solutions, it, it makes for a really good relationship. So coming to them being like, Hey guys, like, look, like I'm not seeing anything here. What are you seeing? Um, there's also some agencies that have gotten to the point where they're just doing driver information exchanges. And while it's not always important because we're trying to focus on fatal severe um, crashes, once once you're at a location fixing it, it can still that information can still help with um, understanding what trends are going on. Any other questions on uh, actually getting to the data? So everybody understands what we're doing, right? Or at least knows to stay out of 60 days. All right, so cleaning the data. Uh, so one of the big ones is uh, when we get to cleaning the data is making sure that crashes that are occurring outside project limits are removed. Um, so for safety analysis purposes, the project limits are based on the influence area, the intersection or segment. I got it right this time. Um, as discussed in step one. Uh, but it's it, it is one of those like even though we have good location information, it just just reviewing it, making sure that um, when it gets tied to the lo the location query, that it that it is truly what you're looking for. Um, use GIS or a crash specific roadway ID and milepost to determine if it's outside the influence area. Um, we want to make sure that crashes in parking lots or outside of the influence area are removed. Um, so you don't see that as much anymore, but at the same, but still, like if it if it starts, depending on how it's coded, if it starts to get close, sometimes it'll pick up things. Um, recode crash severities that are blank or non-traffic fatality to no injury. Uh, that that's a big one. That stuff helps. Like you're still going to get your your fatal severe injury stuff, but what it helps is when you're doing. Um, you'll see spreadsheets uh, showed up. We've done some work with District Seven. District Seven has a. Um, a scoping process for desktop safety reviews, and they have um, like a whole page of of graphs looking at trends. When you're starting to deal with stuff like that, you want to make sure that all of your language is the same, so that it can it can read it and present the data accurately. <clears throat> so when to review the actual crash report? Honestly, um, you should really review review severe injuries all the time. Um, but it's but especially when you're looking at a review of the crash um the study includes the review the study includes collision diagrams you need to review the crash reports to know understand what to put into the collision diagrams um you're looking at specific crash types so verifying that they're accurately coded and that um that the study that you're doing necessitates a deeper understanding of crash patterns ben i thought you threw some stuff into chat did you want to address a little bit more of that Oh, um, it, not not in the subject you're talking about, but uh, regarding the the currency of the map that was mentioned earlier. That's what I was commenting on. Okay, um, and then uh, the guidance there in the, in the safety crash data guidance document. There's some more stuff about how to recode certain things um, if you're really trying to do more, um, especially when you're trying to use say Excel or JS or something like that to to understand the crashes better. So sources and limitations of the crash data. Honestly, it starts with law enforcement. Um, the and that's one of the things we we do a lot of training with law enforcement, um, working with that hand in hand to try to make sure that the information that's presented on the the crash reports is good. Uh, I think we had a question about mobility, and micro mobility, and how that's reported. That's been a conversation in recent years. Um, but it gets into the quality and precision and it gets into the tool used to report crashes um, and how the officer is is going to understand and record things. Um, an example, one example that's not necessarily safety related, but um, the DOT had issues, especially with asset maintenance, um, because insurance companies and, and like how things are reimbursed depend on that a lot of times they'll go off of the the 
crash report the officers did, but the officers doing an estimate of the damages caused by the crash by just kind of gut feeling. Um, there's been some work to get them guidelines for how much to estimate. So just kind of understanding that. Um, so accuracy and Brazilian. So like, when you're looking at pedestrian crashes, that's a big one. Um, the assessment of, say, failure to yield. Um, so the way Florida law is, is that as long as you're at a side street and you're not bracketed by two signals, you can legally cross the roadway as a pedestrian. You do have to give a, a driver has to have enough time to stop before you step off, though. Um, but the, and the driver is required to yield once the pedestrian is in the lane. So when you, but when you're dealing with stuff um, in that failure to yield conversation, it's a judgment of the officer after it happened who wasn't there to observe it as to whether or not the the pedestrian failed to yield to a driver or a driver failed to yield to the pedestrian, right? So you can see where there's going to be some confusion in that and not to always understand that it's necessarily the pedestrian's fault. Um, so when you, there's going to be more variability. Um, when you get into crash movements, roadway features, injury assessments, uh, we had that question before. It, that is an assessment on from the officer of what's going on. Um, estimates of damaged costs are a big one. It, it really just depends on how conscientious the officer is, what their personal knowledge is, uh, and, and what to what to call it. Um, there is a uniform traffic crash reporting manual that kind of starts that, that starts to outline what they need to be looking at and what should be happening. Um, but it's still it's still dependent on the individual officer knowing. Um, there's a lot that officers are required to know. Um, sometimes things start to slip through the cracks occasionally. They still do a really good job. The point is not to run them down. It's just to understand that there are some some weaknesses sometimes to what we're getting. Uh, if the drivers leave the scene, um, getting that information, crashes that don't involve a motor uh, vehicle but do result in injuries. Um, say we use a bicycle to bicycle crash, but we could look at uh, micromobility. There's a, one of the issues in micromobility is that you've got people in middle age that haven't used a scooter since they were, you know, five or six years old, and now they're on a 20 mile an hour scooter in an urban environment, and they tend to run into things. Um, very minor crashes as well. Um, we talked earlier, paper agencies. Um, <clears throat> right now we're looking at 5% of less of crash reports still being submitted on paper, but uh, I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that 5% is like, hey, we have the FHP and 5% of those, their reports. It's more of like out of all of Florida, 5%. So what you're going to run into yes. is that particular agency, you're going to get to an agency that doesn't do it. So it's not like, well, there's a 5% variance. It's like, it, you know, to Lori, to your point, you could be in this this town and not see any crashes. And that's where you're going to find your problems. We we have nearly 400 um, law enforcement agencies in the state. So it's like 370 something or 380 something. And um, a handful of them, a uh, smaller and smaller handful, are still using paper. Usually they're very small agencies, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> Some years may have issues uh, working to improve the quality and accuracy, but there are there's a lot of people and um, Ben's got 24 people um, working night and day to get this done. But there is there, there's just, um, you yeah, know, I'm sure everyone's working for the department understands you have a finite amount of staff and an infinite workload. Um, it doesn't stop. So you do as good as you can, but there are still issues. And that's one of the things, these things are helpful to understand, um, especially when you're talking to elected officials and leaders, because the leaders like to see, hey, like, why do these two numbers not line up? And it's understanding that it's, things change. Like both reports were accurate, potentially like when they're pooled, but more data comes in as you go. Um, the one particular one that I have seen, uh, and this is is being aware of similar side streets. Uh, so particularly like if you look at, say, District 1, District 1 has uh, U.S. Business 41 and U.S. 41, and they're only a couple miles from each other. So you get all the same cross streets. So if you have 56th Street with Business 41 and U.S. 41 or 57th, I used in this example, but 56 is also one of the ones I ran into. Um, you're going to find you may find that there's not any crashes. But then you go over to the next intersection in U.S. Business 41, and all of a sudden there's a 
a crap ton of crashes because it's been if you're not familiar with the area when you go through and you verify it's like okay well this make this is where it says it's at it's at this one but and i've also seen with um especially with some of our subdivisions you get some of these subdivisions that kind of have like a, a u-shaped even if it's squiggly a u-shaped road and it's the same name so it's the same road it's the same name road but all the crashes will be on this side and not this side or they'll be mixed up um, so just being careful with the area that you're doing and making sure that uh, when we're doing location verification, um, it, just making sure that it did get to the right one, because that is one of the easiest ones to kind of slip up as the, as the name um, usage. <clears throat> and then if you have any problems, Ben Jacobs is your man. Um, honestly, I've known Ben for years. Um, ben is a phenomenal resource at this. Um, you are going to get uh, all the information you can want on crash reports. Um, he's very patient, uh, very, very knowledgeable. Uh, so if you do have a, if you do have questions, reach out. Um, uh, he is, I don't know how many times has helped out uh, saving us on something, being able to, to kind of outline what's going on and figure it out. So understanding crash reports, long form versus short form. I, I had a few more slides. I was going to get into the um, uh, the statute, but I'm going to stick with the guidance on this one um, because I want to make it sure it's it's something we can easily understand. So the the biggest difference, right? So long form crash are it is completed with in the following conditions, right? It's the death of or personal injury or personal injury to or any indication of complaints of pain or discomfort. So there's basically there's death or injury you have to do long form. Um, a driver leaves the scene um, without providing information or rendering aid. Uh, an involved road user was under drugs or influence of drugs or alcohol. Uh, uh, the vehicle was damaged so much a wrecker had to remove it, or it involved a commercial motor vehicle. Um, the big difference between the two is that the long form will contain a collision diagram and a narrative. Short form. Um, they're not required. It may be there, but it, it's not required to be done. Um, and the, the driver information exchange isn't included. So it, it the, both will be in there. Um, long form is the, the really the most important. Um, it's, it has the most stringent requirements. Uh, it's the most useful in doing it. But just understand there's a difference between long form and short form. It mattered a little bit more when you had different um, crash databases right now it's more important just to know and that there is some requirements when it comes to doing like official uh, benefit cost analysis so <clears throat> crash diagrams are broken into um or crash reports sorry are broken into uh different sections and some of this we'll go through the sections i'll say a little bit why it matters um but you have the event page where it talks about what happened um the date of the crash crash location information you're letting all your condition stuff um manner collision harmful events uh, things like that then we get to the vehicle page uh, vehicles talk about who is involved sometimes there's multiple vehicles so just making sure that you're um if you're trying to read through it and figuring it out you're you're kind of tracking who's the driver of which vehicles who's the passengers what's going on um, when you get to multiple vehicles it can start to get confusing uh, but that's where you're going to look up your information. Um, you can see up in there's vehicle diagrams as well, where it'll start to talk about like where you're hit and a little more specific information. Uh, this is this information is kind of what's pulled when you start looking at like your Excel files. All the data fields are coming from this information. Um, when you're reading through them, looking at the narrative and the diagram helps to make sense of what this information is saying. And the person page. So this is where we'll talk about victims, passengers, the drivers, stuff like that. If you want to see, you know, DUIs, injury severities, stuff like that. That's this is where you're going to find that information. Then you'll get into your narrative page, and they just write down what they noticed is happening. And your diagram page. Um, some of these are entertaining. Uh, I've seen, um, I think that my favorite one I crash report I ever found um, was someone who got T-boned on a straight line segment. And what you found is um, I, his wife was trying to take him out. 
Um, she went into oncoming traffic and then went down the road and then came in from the opposite side of the road and, and T-boned him while he was um, <laughs> trying to escape, essentially. So you, you get to some of these crash reports and they get, um, you know, they're not all doom and gloom. Some of them can be um, interesting. And the users that use our roadways do have some, as we said, people are flawed. They don't always make the best decisions. Um, and you get a, a front row seat on that. But but ultimately breaking it down um, and understanding where to find that information. One of the things that's important with this is that when you look at like say the signal four, but saying like, hey, here's an angle crash and here's here's this, right? It some of the crash types aren't explicitly outlined in the crash report. It takes a couple data fields to combine that information to do the final output. And that's where some of that that post crawl that post crash data processing comes in to make sure that you're getting that information. Uh, so getting into um, crash types, it's a, going back to what I said, it's a calculated value. Um, so you're looking at like the first harmful event, manner of collision impact, number of vehicles, vehicle maneuver action, vehicle travel direction, uh, vehicle area of initial impact. You're, you're looking at the different fields and you're plugging it, putting them together to come out with the final output of the crash types. And just to make sure we have those covered. Um, one of the biggest ones with understanding is the angle and left turn crashes. Uh, so I'm going to do some diagrams of each of them just to make sure, um, especially if it's your first time seeing this, you're understanding when we're the, vernac the vernacular of what we're doing. Um, so the the biggest difference, uh, angle and left turn crashes are all T-bolts. But the big difference is an angle crash type is your crossing movements. Um, you have one person going one way, one person going the other, and they're they're perpendicular to each other, and you're going to have the impact on the side of the vehicle. Left turn crashes are are, are that perpendicular impact, but it's due to a left turn. Um, the reason why that can get significant is the types of treatments that you use. If you're dealing with a median opening, for instance, and you have angle crashes, a directionalization will prevent the angle crashes because it's that straight across movement that you're doing. Um, and now people can go down, take a right and do a U-turn. Left turn crashes, it may or may not prevent. Um, so if you have left turns from a side street where you're coming out, and doing this way and you're getting crossed, directionalization will prevent. But if your left turn is from um, the main line turning left on the side street, directionalization would not prevent. Uh, so understanding those crash types um, is helpful when making sure when we're selecting countermeasure, making sure we're selecting the ones that will actually prevent it. Um, you have the side swipes opposing, um, so it's lane departure, right? The opposing side swipe, same direction side swipe can be lane departure. It can be someone that's not paying attention when they're merging, uh, head on opposing, and then the rear end of crash types. Any questions on, um, so we're doing good on time, so we, we can we can park and, and, and discuss if you want. Any questions so far on crash reports like what you're going to get out of it how to look at it um crash types things like that and i'll say right now especially with ben in the room this is this is the best time that you know you've ever had to ask these questions um it really he truly is a resource so if, if you have him please ask so everyone's an expert then katie <laughs> right <laughs> we have achieved success clear Clear as mud, right? So yes. <clears throat> one thing I just would like to reiterate is um, pulling the crash reports and storing them. I believe it's our preference, at least in District 4, and I don't know how Central Office feels, but I would prefer people not to pull those crash reports and add them to emails, put them in reports, et cetera. Like we use them, view them, pull data that you need to make your engineering judgment from them. And then don't don't keep them in, in something because we get a lot of public records requests. And I'm sure back in the day we have big reports with, you know, 30 crash reports attached to them. But that's going to be a problem moving forward because we're not the owners like like was reiterated at the beginning. Right, Ben? Right. So I can say on that. Um, it, it's probably a bad idea unless it's ne absolutely necessary to put a crash report in an email or attach it to an email because all those emails are stored. They do become public record exactly. going back and forth and if somebody asks for a crash and then you have to then search all of your email files to find whether you ever sent it yeah that could be really annoying 
Um, so just no, yeah. but I can say also that legal is legal has agreed uh, here in central office anyway that if you yeah. download a set of crash reports so you can review them, you're making temporary copies, and if if you need those for a period of time to get your job done as you review the documents, you are then okay to delete the documents as transitory or temporary copies. You can get rid oh. of them without having to never... retain them for four years. Yeah. Okay. And it would never file file fall into a public records request. Because our as preference as... when we get yep. public records requests for crash reports is just like we've talked about before. Go to FLHSMB. They're the yep. owners, period. That's the, okay. that's the, they are the source. Yes. Uh, the loop, the, the thing to remember there is FDOT does have an official crash records database, crash reports database. We are not adding to it or maintaining it anymore, but we do have four years of data sitting in it, four years of documents sitting in it. Um, you can send those requests to me if you think, uh, if okay. it's between 20, 2019 and 2022. <laughs> um, and we can do my my staff can do that search and 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 handle the redaction or the response if necessary and we will eventually purge all those documents as the four-year retention period expires and get rid of them but we do have okay. at least one official source of dot copies of those documents okay perfect good to know it looks like we do have one question yeah before, uh, Lois, I'll get to it in a minute um one thing when you, if you are needing to send it to somebody um when you pull the excel files um, and you, let's say you uh, create a table in Excel, right? So that you can sort. When you get the information you need, it's very easy to just copy and paste the the crash report numbers. Um, so that way, someone can easily just put it in there, get it themselves. Uh, it, it, it's a couple extra steps, but it's not prohibitive. Uh, Lois, well, I was just going to say we've got an interesting group of of people involved here, and I'm on the planning side, so I, it seems like there might be two two levels to this. The one I'm in is being educated about what's available, what's appropriate in terms of using available data, that sort of thing for developing plans and studies, and then being able to choose effectively what consultants we tap to uh, help us on the safety side of things. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm putting in the chat now, but you talked about pasting in a set of crash report numbers. Anybody who has access to Signal 4 with authorization to view the crash reports has a tool where they can view the crash reports if you give them a list of the numbers. So it's it should be maybe not quite as convenient as having a downloaded file of them, but you should just still be able to go through a list of crash report numbers and view them live on Signal 4. Lori? Thank you. Um, do, does the additional permission expire or is it like project dependent? Or consultants, you mean? Um, either or well, both. So for FDOT employees, as long as you're an FDOT employee, you have the access um, that you've asked for. You should ask for access to less than 60 day old data if that's what you need. And if you no longer need it, then you know, you, we can, we can, if, if somebody tells us you don't need it, we can take it away. Um, but DOT is permanent as long as you're a DOT. And then if you're a consultant, it's based on project dates and the account will expire at the end of the project or actually FLHSMV is asked to limit it to two years at a time. So we'll give you a two year window and it can be renewed if necessary, but And the, as far as the degree of access, it's up to the project manager to tell us what degree of access the consultants would need. Great. Any other final questions before we move on? I just want to mention, so in our safety report, any safety report, you will not find crash report, even the attachment for that reason. Because years ago, maybe a decade ago, we used to put the as attachment, but for that reason, and when you get a public record request, it, it was such a pain to go over every report to find if we have it or not, and now we don't have it. But we do mention the crash number and some kind of brief description about the fatal crash, this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so, so I would suggest anyone if you have crash analysis in your report do not 
you will attach the class report in your study report. Good advice. When you have, you have the summary and you have the crash diagrams, um, it's usually sufficient. All right, pulling crashes. Um, we're going to do a high level overview and then I'll uh, direct you to some resources. So when you get to the Signal 4 um, analytics dashboard, the top right, the little person up there is where we're going to click on and log in. And when we get in there, uh, we can go to event analysis and search for our crashes. Um, so the little plus sign is is indicating that you want to do a new crash um, query. You have your date range that you put in. Uh, so remember five years um, with exceptions, if you see it right, um, up to let's say 60 days of the current date. Um, and then when we get down to that geographic boundary, we have some options. Um, so we can get into, oops, sorry. Uh, boundaries of MPOs, of cities, of counties, um, but you can also start identifying intersections. Um, so it, it'll kind of, you know, like kind of like look, type into Google and it'll come up with suggestions. Um, you can identify intersections that way. You can identify roadways, um, mileposts, and I, um, roadway ID and milepost. Um, and then you can also uh, do a custom area where you kind of, where you draw a boundary around what you're looking for. Um, boundary is always very quick, uh, but it also you have to understand that if you start doing that, you're going to have more cleaning because you're not it, you, those all that great location data that been tied to, say, a street and a roadway. Um, you're no longer getting that. You're just getting everything within the box that you drew. Uh, so you start picking up a lot of extras as well. And then once you get down to um, circumstances, you get into things like um, where you want to search for, say, if it's wet weather or nighttime crashes. Um, you can get into severities. You can get into um, who is involved in those crashes. If you want to get into vehicles, like conversion motor vehicles, stuff like that, um, and you'll end up with a, a screen like this. It'll kind of have like a quick summary of the, your date range, um, the geographical information and then the different attributes or the filters that you've applied to it and the little download button is over there on the bottom left when you click that something like a screen like this is going to come up um, it's going to have a whole lot of different um, information uh, for me i usually go with the crash event in this case the crash and roadway vehicle but personally i also i like the dot roadway um, I'll be honest, normally I use the crash event one. I, it's generally something that's a lot, just the, what I'm doing uh, being useful. You have GIS information you can get into if you're looking at pet bike specifics. Um, and then that little thing where it says police crash reports and PDF. Right now, the limit is, I believe, 100 records, but that's that dangerous button of downloading the, the crash records to yourself. Uh, you'll get something like this. You'll, you'll consent and say, okay, um, this is what I'm looking for. And then usually it's pretty quickly. Sometimes it takes a while, but usually it's pretty quickly. You will get an email in your inbox um, to go ahead and download the data. And what will happen is a zip file will come to your your um, your computer. Uh, when you open that zip file, um, you'll have a number of depending on what options you select. It depends on what's in the zip file, but ultimately you'll get your crash tables. Sometimes there'll be a README. Um, the Police reports, if you selected to download, will be in PDF form. So, in that light of transitory documents, just make sure that if you do that, um, let's say you transfer them to another file, you're making sure you're deleting all the instances of those files when you are done. So, to drill down into it, um, the the PDF, uh, or sorry for for this presentation, I put a QR code so if someone's looking on a screen, they can get to it. Um, it's it's on the FDOT official YouTube under the safety section, um, but getting into the safety crash data guidance training and that in terms of downloading the data, uh, there's more specific step by step information there, and there's going to be more videos to follow. Um, and then getting into as well, uh, LTAP has some training as well on the seats on um, the Signal 4 analytics. So linking to that training as well. Um, Sigma 4 has its own stuff. Um, I do like these 
training modules a little bit better because it's more pointed at what where signal four is covering everything that you can do. Um, this is this is covering items that are a little more near and dear to exactly what we're doing, and you don't have to sift through some of the information to find what's important. Any questions on that? Glory. Rewind a little bit, please. So are we evaluating whether it was a head on T bone crash side swipe by looking at the diagrams? Is that or is it in the column? It's already a field in the data. So the yes, yes, yes. Um, so that evaluation, um, part of that understanding was because this this training is geared to people of all levels. Um, there are some people that I, that may not know the difference between different crash types. So part of the reason for those slides was kind of just covering that. Um, but when you are looking at the crash data to determine what's going on, um, the sometimes it's difficult to see what's going on looking at the crash report without the narrative and diagram um, because it's just it's there it, it'd be like watching a movie versus watching someone that put um a camera shutter at like one click every five seconds right so like if you're looking at the crash data form that the usefulness there is largely in the ability to go back after the fact and look at data trends and analysis. Um, the narrative and diagram is oftentimes the most useful thing for an individual analysis because you're getting the officer walking you through what happened. Um, the crash reports do not general, generally say like it, it does with some but some of the crash types like it, it doesn't always say like say left turn and angle explicitly what it's doing is it's taking multiple fields and combining those attributes in multiple fields to spit out the final determination and then that's what like signal four is going to display to you i have a, a little history on this one right um uh, i don't know if it was before nathan's time but way back in before 2011 we had a field on the crash report that said the crash type or impact type something like that that was used heavily by our engineers and it was what we pretty much what we expected to to classify the crash as left turn right turn angle that kind of thing when we changed to the new crash report form we lost that 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 one field and the factors that inform it got distributed over a couple fields at the crash level and some fields at the vehicle level and um so the districts began pretty promptly complaining that they didn't have that field anymore and we, we came up with an algorithm to figure out what it should be based on the other codes signal four has put that process into their system so it calculates that automatically for each crash it's as good as the officer's coding is. So the, if the officer gives us good coding in those five different fields, then we'll get a decent evaluation of the crash type from signal four. And we have, I have personally been a part of training with law enforcement um, where younger officers have not understood, especially, I mean, most of the ones are easy to understand except for angle left turn. That's where it starts to get fuzzy, I find with folks. Um, We've been in training with law enforcement just because it's. One of the complaints is the sheer amount of information they need to know, especially if they're not traffic full time. Um, so like they love tip cards because they but, but at that same time, their their books fill up with tip cards um, and it, it just. There's there's a lot they have to get through and sometimes it. It doesn't always it's not always as accurate as it could be. But. Even though we say that we're talking about exceptions, it's like that five percent with paper crashes. The vast majority of it's in good shape. So, like, I like don't 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 look at it and be like, oh my gosh, it's not going to be accurate. Like, you know, I don't know the percentages, but I would say probably like ninety eight percent of it, 90, 95, 98 is is in really solid shape. It's not that bad. It's just it's just knowing like the point of saying it isn't to scare you off of it. It's it's just to to make sure you understand that. 
when you are looking at it, especially if you start making high profile decisions, just understand that you, it, sometimes you got to drill in a little bit further. Spencer? Yeah, I was just going to add to that, Nathan. I think it also just depends on on the analysis that you're doing. If you're looking more at a corridor or or wider area type level, you know, maybe it's less important to to drill down and to, you know, making sure you get all the angle and left turn right. You know, you'll have you'll have a pretty good good idea of it um, based on the accuracy. But you know, going back to Nathan's example at an individual median opening. Um, then it could be important to you know go through and read those crash reports, and sometimes it's even challenging with with the narrative. It could be it could be unclear, um, but it's you know it's the the officers don't don't have an easy job when they're you know reacting to to a crash as well. Um, and so it's just just uh, just wanted to to note that. So Lori, for you particularly, and access coming from access management. Uh, using high level trends is sufficient for identifying where you should do a corridor project. But when you go to hearing, I would make sure your crashes are right. Um, it, when it goes to hearing and you start dealing with people that want to do, um, that want to protest or you have a developer that gets their engineer into it, that's when like making sure that your, your data is, is accurate is it starts to become really, really important. Um, or even like, especially like pd and &E, I don't know if you assist, we used to assist pd and &E, um, access management decisions. I don't know if you still do or not. Um, but when you get to pd and &E and you start looking at eminent domain and property takings, um, a lot of times the negotiation your legal office does for a cure involves access management. Um, so being able to make sure the data is good when it starts going to court for when you start looking at cures and this, that, and it, when it starts getting sticky. All right, so summarizing data. Um, this is uh, summarizing data. We've got some examples here just talking through uh, generalities, but because the, there's some good rules of thumb of what should be supervised to get ideas, but understand too, like it's also project dependent. Like what you're trying to accomplish um, necessitates the, the how you're you're getting that data displayed. Um, so when we look at say crashes by year and severity, um, in this example here, you know, you have a new traffic signal that changes what's going on in the intersection. Um, using, I'll use the example I did a, earlier of, um, I think it was 301 in Rutland Road, uh, where we found out the turn lane. When, when we, it didn't make sense when we looked at the total crash rate and the total crashes, but when we started looking at the graph of um, crashes by year in severity, we started realizing that there is that massive spike two years ago, right? And that that led us to understanding that the traffic patterns at that location changed, and we need to we need to get into it a little bit more. Uh, when you start looking by months, um, it, it, potential seasonal improvements, uh, you know, some of the some of the beach communities start to become very very seasonal, so it may not be an issue. Uh, most of the year, but it is it is when the seasonal visitors are there and being able to target those type of solutions. Um, day of week and severity. Uh, so whether it needs to be, say, education enforcement campaigns, um, you know, is it people going to work? Is it, um, you know, recreational users? Is it if it's during the day, it, you know, your target demographic during the day could be um either shift workers or it could just be older uh, older populations getting out and about understanding that um you know looking at crash at a looking at um by crash attribute and that that helps guide you towards um different solutions so if it's angle left turn crashes in the quarter looking at access management solutions or looking at traffic control um you know if you're seeing a lot of Say left turn and angle crashes pop up, and it's all signalized intersections. Good access management. Maybe it's protective phasing that you need to look at. So, um, looking at that type of stuff and understanding where it goes. And remember, with the Vision Zero, we're looking at fatal, severe crashes. So, if you're looking at say those side swipes um, and those side swipes down there, it, it's mostly property damage only. You're not seeing that much, but your rear ends are getting into some injury. So, understanding that hey, like we don't really need to worry about side swipes right now. But if it's say it's a signalized intersection. Maybe you need advanced delimazone detection to help prevent some of the rear end crashes. Um, 
in getting the lighting condition, this is pretty self obvious, right? Or um, understanding that, hey, are we having a nighttime crash issue? Um, and, and that helps when you start looking at the district trends. Um, so if you're just, if you know, if you're looking at district wide, you have a 30% nighttime crash rate, and you're at 40% here. You understand that there's there's more of an issue. Um, as time goes on, the district wide crash rate should go down. So just because it meets the district crash rate still doesn't mean you shouldn't do something. It just means that if you're much higher above it, it's it's a lot higher than what's expected for that area and you need to pay attention to that more. Um, collision diagrams are very helpful and this is where you need to get into the long form crashes and start looking at the diagrams and the narratives because um, Collision diagrams help tell the story. It helps get all those different pieces of the story into something that's that's right in front of you uh, to be able to identify some of the trends that are that are happening. <clears throat> so we've only got six more slides. I'm going to keep going. Um, once you get that data in a way that's easy for you to digest, whether it's uh, summary sheets, whether it's your graphs, whether it's um, the crash diagrams, you start doing the analysis. Um, and, and we we've talked about a, a number of different ones. Um, you have empirical bays, um, average crash frequencies, relative severity, critical crash rates. For this purpose, it's the qualitative analysis. Like for what we are doing in this in this area, we are looking at the qualitative analysis. So we're not worrying about the trend as much of the trends. We're not worried about the rates as much. We want to say, are there crashes happening? Um, where the crash is happening, what are they, what's the severity, what's causing them, and then look for design solutions. Um, so when we're looking at it, you know, we're looking at what the fatal crash, in, um, the fatal crashes are, the serious injury crashes, total injury crashes. So to make sure we're not contradicting ourselves, the reason why we look at all crashes is for the trend information. Um, we want to pay attention to the fatal severe, but all crashes help because what we're looking, let's say you have a, um, a 55 mile an hour facility and you're getting angle crashes, but you don't have fatal and severe yet. Um, you've been lucky, right? Because when you look at risk exposure at 55 miles an hour and you're looking at a T-bone, um, you're looking at all of the conditions being present for severe crashes. They just haven't happened yet. So and seeing that trend and being able to get out ahead of it is important as well. You're still looking at fatal severe, but you're looking at that risk factor at that point. Um, understanding your total crash number. So this is just literally just here's the the, the sheer volume of crashes, uh, and that's all it is, right? It, it's sheer volume. I have a thousand crashes here versus five hundred crashes here. Getting into high crash rates is different. Um, so crash rate is essentially the, the official crash rate is your number of crashes times a million and divided by um, number of days by the average daily traffic and the number of miles of uh, the quarter you're looking at. And this is an adjusted crash value. Um, so the difference in this, this one thing we want to explain, the difference between a crash rate and a crash volume is a measure of exposure, essentially. <clears throat> if I have um, I-4, I-4 has a massive crash number, right? Um, but when we start to adjust by the mileage of I-4 and the amount of vehicles in I-4, we start to see that the crash rate is much less than some of And that's where the crash rates versus crash numbers can get tricky. You can have really high crash numbers somewhere and you should still pay attention to it. But when we're looking for like low hanging fruit, that crash rate sometimes can be more important because you're looking at finding a, an area that has um, a much higher amount of crashes than what you would expect. Um, and when we're getting to the qualitative analysis, look for your patterns. Um, sometimes one crashes are important. I remember one day we had one fatality that was a drainage as a wet weather crash. Um, but when we went and looked at the narrative, we found that the officer acknowledged water was ponding on the road. We reached out to maintenance. Maintenance confirmed that that was a location of ponding. And that was a very, very easy connection without a pattern of saying, hey, like this needs to be fixed right now. Um, but generally the patterns are what's gonna guide you. Uh, you can start to see, cause, cause there's going to be one-offs that happen. Um, generally understanding that, hey, this is consistently happening points to an engineering solution. Uh, remember your lessons from module four, we've talked all the way up to here. You know, we've talked about 
the different types of network analysis. Um, well, if you're on your project, you're looking at historical crashes, you're looking at risk factors, um, and you're building stuff out. You're looking at the safe systems approach, being able to take multiple countermeasures and bring them in um, so that you, you're building a web of failure. We were in St. Pete for Transplex, and I was looking at some of the high rise construction. Um, and when you start looking at that, like the guys that are up there, they have all their, you know, their vests, their hard hats, their their boots on. They have fall protection. If they're not actively working on a section, there's railings put up around the area. And then all of them that were working over a certain elevation had a harness on that had a rope. And you could see them kind of get aggravated at it because it wouldn't feed. If they move too fast, it would lock up the harness would. Um, but the idea is essentially like if you fall, it's going to catch you and it's going to catch you before you fall enough that that hurts you. Um, and then uh, kind of thinking through that that thought process we talked about in the last module where you're looking at, you know, helping people make better decisions. You're looking at reducing the exposure and the risks of what's going on. Um, and then making sure that if we're if we're really getting into it, um, reading the narratives as well to understand what's going on. So when we're incorporating it, remember, we're all safety specialists. I know it's an official position at the department, but um, it's not, you know, Tracy's job and Katie's job is the outreach, the education, that it's building the support and the structure for the department, and it's managing the HSIP funds, right? Um, every person in your job has the responsibility to focus on safety as much as you can in, in your job and your responsibilities. And we to reiterate this because this is very important to me um we have a moral imperative like we, we we've shown before and if you need more data i'm happy to sit down and convince you um we know that what we're doing does make a difference when we make engineering and planning solutions we empirically can show that we are making a difference when we do it so we have an option between a and b regardless of what all of our other measures are safety is our first measure right we have a moral obligation to make the safest decision because we know that we can make a difference. And if we're not, people are going to get hurt. Um, crash data is a big tool in that. Uh, would you like we would use our computer or email? Um, it's not just countermeasures. Like countermeasures are the things that come after a crash is happening. We want to make sure that we're we're not doing this, uh, you know, hey, we'll build this and then if crashes happen, we'll fix it later. We want to make sure that we're building this. Um, from the sense in the very beginning to prevent crashes from happening. Um, so I appreciate this. I know this is a dry module, um, but it is is very critical. This is the foundation of everything that we're doing is that data. Um, if you remember, uh, we've so we've we've talked about thinking through how to address crashes. We've talked about getting the data to do crashes. Um, from here on out, we're going to be getting into the actual emphasis areas and actual applicate. Uh, we're talking about the application of countermeasures to solve that. And then on the 29th, uh, we have the workshop and it looks like Katie has cars lined up as well. Um, so some of you, uh, some of you get a nice sedan and some of us are going to be joining <laughs> us on the safety bus. Yes. Um, so nobody has to reserve their own vehicles that day. Gordon's already set aside them. And we'll have uh, you don't have to worry about remembering it right now. As we get closer, we'll have kind of outlines of what's going to be going on and doing it. I just want to kind of make sure I know sometimes I like to have the big picture of what I'm going to be looking for that day. Um, so just know we're, we are like State Farm. You're in good hands. Um, so at, at the end of this module, uh, knowing what's going on, um, we've got another about 20 minutes before the next module. Uh, anybody have any questions uh, of what's going on? Uh, Carla. Good morning, everyone. Um, kind of a question about the summarizing of data and also kind of going off of what uh, Benjamin said in the chat. Is there a standard um, spreadsheet or things that are used? Because I know when CARS was being used, there was, I don't know if it was developed by FDOT or if it was something that was developed by a consultant and just everyone used it, that summarized the crash data into percentages by year, uh, percentages by crash type, and things like that. Do you know if that's something that's being developed by by for use with Signal 4 or if that's something that is kind of everyone has their own way of summarizing it? Yes and yes. Um, so the, a lot of folks, uh, consultants, especially consultants, have their own in-house spreadsheets. Um, Signal 4 has ability to do some of that. Um, I'm not sure if there's a standard FDOT spreadsheet or not. Ben, do you know? 
standards for the um, average? Well, more for of, like um, the you know crash data by year, other other than what Signal Four provides. Or Tracy, you, you might be a good person to answer that as well. If District Four has one. Do you have Tracy? Do you have a stand? Does District Four have a standard crash uh, trend reporting spreadsheet? We we do have the uh, like annual uh, crash trend report like dashboard. No, like um, if someone's pulling crashes on a project, they can dump it into a spreadsheet. You know, like on one part of the workbook, they can dump the crashes in, mm -hmm. and then like the hey, other. Sheet. We do have that. Yeah, we do have that. Um, which when you use that spreadsheet, and you will need to double check. Because especially it's not like a um like the central office publication or FWA publication. So there's some kind of it could have some errors. And we use that for every uh when we summarize data. Um I think D6 also use kind of similar or same uh as a tool. We can uh, probably to add a either. To that. But yeah, you can QC it after you use it. Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. Spencer, you want to go first? I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, I saw I was just gonna say probably the same thing you were, Ryan. So I'll yeah. Hand it to you. You can go ahead. Okay. So yeah, D6 had a spreadsheet that that D4 has been using historically as well. Um that kind of gets to uh the question that was being asked, basically taking in raw data. At that time it was from CAR, uh crash analysis reporting mm -hmm. system, and summarizing it, you know year by year, uh, different crash types, different um, environmental factors you might want to see, like weather and road, you know, pavement condition, things like that. Um, as Nathan mentioned, a lot of consultants have developed similar spreadsheets that they use internally. Uh, something that we're doing for the state safety office right now, and I alluded to that in the chat, um, is we're taking that spreadsheet that you all are probably familiar with in D4 um, and those in D6 as well, and we're updating it so that it ingests signal four data instead of set of car data and then there's also um, some other improvements uh, that we're making to it to to allow you to make um, some comparisons across different uh, you know intersection types and things like that that you may have in common um, with your study site so I actually have a meeting this afternoon to review uh, progress on that with uh, the person in in our shop that's developing it. So I'm excited to uh, push that forward. I anticipate we'll be able to share that in the next month or so. Well, that's exciting. Um, also kind of wanted to add on my second part of my question is because Ben said in the chat that there is uh, no official uh, like averages for wet road and, and nighttime crashes. So where are consultants and also like there's FDOT documents that say this is higher or lower than than it's like th I think it's like 30% or 15% of either one. I don't remember which one so, it is. Where are those coming from? So I can tell you some of that, right? In the car system, when we 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 we, we looked at developing um, frequency analyses for those crash types for um, nighttime and wet weather and those sort of things, and we took some logical steps, like we looked at a map of average rainfall across the state, and it turns out that it varies between 21 and 28 percent or something, but about 25 percent of the time it's raining in somewhere in Florida so, or raining in Florida. So we took 25, we took 25 percent as a threshold for if there's more than 25 percent of crashes of in wet weather that that's likely higher than average for a location, right? But that's that we 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 put that in as a parameter in the analysis we ran. But we didn't. We don't have like an average wet weather crash rate for the state so that's we, official. We've discussed this some internally, especially doing trend analysis for a lot of folks, because there isn't like there. That question comes up of what is twenty like what does thirty percent crash crash wet weather crashes mean? Um, because it seems low, right? But then how often is it raining? Because if yep. it's only raining five percent of the time, then that's an extraordinary crash rate. Um, so there, there we believe. We haven't had the opportunity to do it yet, but we've found some weather data systems and databases that we think we can combine that with Signal 4, but we haven't done it yet to prove it. 
and that's essentially what we did manually with the car system way yeah. back when yeah but but this would be instead of statewide we would be able to tie this to location data as well like so mm -hmm. is it specifically raining at that time when it happens oh, like a real time you could okay that would be nice yeah be able because it's yeah. it's it's a database with weather stations so it, it's just a question of how granular it can get and how well it works we can talk more about it if you want ben um lois yeah. Well, this isn't as granular, but I was it's related um, in the world of resilience. South Florida Water Management District has extreme rainfall, future condition type percentages and so forth. The flood hub out of the U University of South Florida is developing these sorts of extreme rainfall projections for the state overall. So it's it's not just what is it raining? We've got these incidences of extreme rainfall. The the pattern is changing. So I don't know. That's not going to get captured retroactively, but I don't know if it's something that's being considered to be built into uh, understanding safety risk moving forward. It is now. <laughs> so we'll have a follow up with Ben on that. Yeah. Um, we in general here, the central office, our job is to support the engineering analysis around the state. So if we can do something globally for everybody, that's the thing we want to do. So if we have a way to, you know, give you a tool that will give you the 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 numbers you need that we can do consistently across the state, that's what we're focused on developing. Um, we don't want to go too far into the specifics of something where in a way that takes away the engineering the freedom of the engineer to make their conclusions. So we just want to we want to support engineering judgment, give them the tools they need to make those judgments. And so yeah, anything we can develop globally, that's our job to support whatever we need to do with analysis. Well just one thing to add, Jennifer Green, our F dot drainage engineer is, is involved in the work of the flood hub. So she's in the middle of all of this as a, if you're not already aware of that. I was not, thank you. Yeah, I think that criteria is basically more like you are not going to read from anywhere, like a publication. It's more like how safety office does their study, how they justify their study, identify like a crash pattern um, to, to, you know, prioritize their project for safety dollars. So if you have unlimited resources or you, you don't need that criteria, basically some, some of the improvement, you know, is always good to have. And we have to prioritize it based on certain uh, engineering judgment or criteria like state average, uh, district-wide average, plus crash pattern. Um, it's just to help us um, to prioritize our project um, because we have very limited safety dollars. To develop project, if we can, we would like to, you know, um, have have improvement everywhere. But we don't, we don't have that resource. So it's more like engineering judgment. It, it's not um, every district may use different criteria. So like district six may use district wide um, nighttime crash average, and district four may use statewide average. It, it's engineering judgment. The other thing, but, but you may is, want to be consistent with your safety office. I, I mean, I mean, district safety office. The, the other thing to keep in mind is crash numbers versus crash rates, right? Because you can have a thirty percent wet weather crash rate, but right. like if it's a rural road and you only have two wet weather crashes, it may not be yeah. a problem. It may just be the fact that there's not a ton of crashes out there and it yeah. dominates the percentage. Exactly. Yeah. Average, see see uh, my last note in the chat. Yeah. Night night nighttime <laughs> nighttime crashes are similar to where like if, if you I mean, yeah, if you only, it, only have like two crashes in total and the one just happened to happen at night, that's fifty percent. But does yeah. that mean that just five for like five million dollar project? No. Got, yeah. So got, you have to look you. at the average plus the crash pattern plus <laughs> where's the location is. <laughs> We did we did we did a, we did an analysis a uh, segment analysis um, in District One. District One's got a lot of rural roads, so you know we had all these roads come up with these massive like nighttime crash crash rates, and then when we got down to it, we started looking at like, hey, I mean, there's like three crashes, there's one crash, there's two crashes, so right. you had to go back later and yep. do another screening, like anything under like five crashes or ten crashes, like throw it out and we'll like relook at the analysis. 
Exactly, yeah. We have, I get those questions very often, actually. How many you consider as a crash? Yeah, it's real. What, I can't say the last one. But remember, like every fatal crash is important, right? So mm -hmm. even if we, even if we're not doing a five million dollar lighting project, it doesn't mean that we can't, you know, look at retroreflectivity of the long line out there, right? Um, mm -hmm. We can't look at signage. We can't look at maybe instead of a full lighting project, maybe it's just an intersection that needs to be lit or something like that. Um, you can you can go crazy with RPMs. Um, we've put some really uh, spicy uh, RPM projects out there. There's one I drove through recently on a construction project on uh, Winter Lake Road. And, um, you know, those RPMs must be like every five feet. It, you go, it looks like a runway that you're driving through the roadway at night. Um, even uh, single soda rumble strips, right? Because you're adding, um, even though our beads are supposed to be retro, -reflect re retro reflective, so it reflects light in any direction, when you start getting surfaces that are more normal to the direction your headlights are hitting, it, it provides more feedback as well. So just because you're not putting, even if it is only one crash, just remember, just you might not do a like a five, ten million dollar lighting project. There still may be other lower cost countermeasures that you can put out there to help address those crashes. Uh, any last minute, uh, Lori? For the crash rate, was it AADT or is it ADT? I saw. I believe the official one is ADT, but but here's the here's the thing to keep in mind with that, right? right? So, the, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just it average daily traffic or annual average daily traffic. We actually use the annual average daily traffic because we, when we're doing multiple years, we sum we have different ADT figures per year. If that helps. But there's. And I think it's good to have a standardized definition. Um, what what it, what's important with that though is there's the like there's the official this is your crash rate right and that's what like central office can report on with the AADT. Um, you can modify how you want to do it. So like if if Tracy want, what I mean by that is like if Tracy's looking at segment analysis and she is wanting to to find new high crash areas that she can make a difference. Um, she may choose to do uh, divide by lane miles. She could choose to look at the ADT or ADT um, uh, adjustment. She could do the ADT plus the the um, the, the the segment miles. Because I think and that equation that was back there that was um, segment miles, so center line miles, right? Like it's not it's not lane miles, so it's it's treating let's say a two lane road the same as an eight lane road. Now, granted, ADT is kind of a proxy for the number of lanes to a degree, um, but there's still a, the the idea there is that understanding that the crash rate is very different than the crash number. The crash number can sometimes be misleading. Nathan, before we close, just you know, one big perspective that you kind of brought up with the whole everybody's a safety specialist. I would say, you know, back in the day, Tracy's office, the safety section when it was in traffic ops was asked by anybody and everybody, hey, can you run this for me? Can you give me this data, et cetera? And we're really trying to change that culture in, in District 4 and statewide. Um, and that's why Central Office has put together all these different resources. Um, you know, you gave the QR codes for the different additional trainings and stuff so that we can focus more on the programming of safety projects and other things and other people can pull their data themselves not that we won't help people um but i just wanted to put that out there so well said. thank you guys for sharing this a, a good example um of that honestly and to, to take it off of the heat off of tracy with it but um you know when uh secretary tebow was in and he did the vital few we got a lot of interest in like how to help safety and there was a lot of requests to the safety office of like hey i have this great idea that you guys can do um and i remember one in particular came from the materials office and the asphalt guys and they they came up with this guy they're well they're well intentioned but they're like hey i've got this great report here that has all of this this asphalt data that you can look at it with crashes and then do safety projects and we started having the conversation. It's like, so like you guys look at the report, the asphalt section looks at the report themselves, and they're the ones that are programming the resurfacing projects. They're the ones that are influencing that. So the conversation is like, but so if you guys are the ones that are making the decisions of where to put the projects, like, and you read the report, instead of 
me adding an additional report to read with my staff and getting involved in somebody else's job function because I'm still going to have to go to you guys at that point to say, here's my recommendation of the report. If everyone's is responsible for safety, then really the conversation is you guys need to read your report. And now when you make your project decisions, you need to be prioritizing safety in your project decisions is what that kind of goes down into. Agreed, um, 100%. Perfect. So, example. so that's kind of, it's, it's not, like, it's one of defend them. It's, it's not a, it's not our job or, a, you know, like stay in a lane. It's, it's just a case of we are all responsible for for the decisions yep. they're making. Everyone is responsible for making safety a priority in your day-to-day decision-making. Agreed, because um, that's the only way we're gonna get to zero. It, yeah. I, I think I think a good way of thinking about it is, it just as a thought experiment, if if you, if, if someone came down, and they said you are responsible personally for reduce, you know, for a 50% reduction in fatal and serious injuries over the next five, you know, five, 10 years, like, what would you change in your day-to-day job to get that if you knew you were going to be held responsible? 